Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 2 1 1. How to draft, revise and edit your thesis and research. This vlog is the end of our writing series and it comes via a series of requests from many of our wonderful students and friends around the world, particularly Irina. Hello, Irina. Irina completed her PhD this week. A great supporter of me, great supporter of Flinders University and this vlog series. And Irina, we are so proud of you. So it's lovely to deliver this vlog to you, acknowledging your incredible achievement. So that's great. So Irina wanted some work on revising and drafting and editing because she found it much more difficult than she thought it would actually be. And isn't that remarkable? So a PhD is hard enough. And yet, wow, revising, drafting, editing is incredibly tough. And why that's such a surprise, I think, is a PhD is so difficult that you do the PhD, you do the research, you do the writing up, and then you have the first draft. And there is your first draft. And you check the little word count on the left-hand side of your word processing program, and you get excited, and you do a little dance. Yeah. Yeah. But then sadly, <laughs> like most gothic moments of happiness in life, that little dance is short-lived. And it's soon replaced by the absolutely horrific realisation that this writing, this first draft, is pretty terrible <laughs> and is going to require some heavy lifting to get it from terrible to terrific. And that's what the vlog's on today. Now, I know these words seem pretty banal drafting, revising, editing. They seem pretty basic. Actually, they are terrible things. So behind these very calm words is a terrible, terrible series of activities. They are frustrating, they are complex, and yes, they are time consuming. And also, can I say very difficult? So I'm not prettying this up for you at all. And I'm using these three words, drafting, revising, and editing, on a continuum today and they do slightly refer to different things. Drafting is more incremental. We do it continually. So we look at that word, we look at the sentence, we have a look at the phrase. It's a continual organic process. Revising is a little bit different and I really wanted to bring that word back to our discussion today. Revising involves us looking at a component or a part of the whole and seeing how that part fits in the whole. So revising, we are revisioning this work, this part, in the context of the whole. Very important part of what we do in a dog trip. And also, of course, editing is a very cold act and it has to be cold. Editing involves you taking a step back from your hot prose that you're so excited and invested in. Editing involves you taking a step back and ensuring with rigour and clarity and coldness that the form of your writing replicates and works with the content of your writing. So every word, every paragraph is assessed coolly and evaluated for its quality. So as you can see, this vlog takes these three strategies for you today and helps you wherever you are. If you're just looking at your first draft and there's thousands of you out there where you've done your first draft, you've done your dance, and then you go, wow, the actual work starts now and you're almost a bit frightened to start it. So for all of you out there, that's cool. But also for every single one of you that maybe you've written a thousand words, you're just at the start of your journey. This practice that I'm talking about today is best commenced right at the start of a PhD, right at the start of a research master's from your first 1,000 words. So wherever you are, the frightening first draft, your first 1,000 words, I'm going to offer something today that will defamiliarize the complexity of what editing, drafting, revising, all this stuff is about and help you do it today. Now I understand this is a very boring discussion. <laughs> it's a very depressing discussion and why editing is so confronting I think is when we read our first drafts we look in the mirror at our own incompetence. <laughs> we read our first draft and we go gee that's that's not good is it? <laughs> that's wow 
Is, is, is that where I'm at? All oh, that's a bit of an embarrassment. So we have to confront our weaknesses and our limitations. And that's emotionally as well as intellectually challenging. But there is also great strength. I want you to gain great confidence and grit and determination from knowing that when you place attention and concentration on your prose, then actually what you're doing is you're demonstrating respect for your research and I think most importantly, respect for your audience, whether that audience be examiners or a wider stakeholder community. And also why I love drafting, revising, editing. I love it. I'm passionate about it because it gets your research, gets your work ready to move. Gets this work that's on your computer, in your little suburb, in your little house, in your little town, on your computer, gets that research ready for the planet, ready to move, momentum, and it makes sure that it is the best of you that you send out into the world. Isn't that exciting? So that's what we're doing today. It is necessary. So for all of you out there thinking, how can I make this a bit easier? Can I pay somebody to edit it for me? If you want to truncate it, you want to simplify this process, actually, that path is very, very rocky. If you think, oh, look, I'll give it a couple of drafts and hope for the best. That's a mistake. It's a short-term mistake. It's also a long-term mistake. And let me tell you about the scale of that mistake. I see so many scholars, including incredibly senior scholars, can I say, who've said to me, oh, look, the results are great. So I've done this research. The results are great. The writing doesn't matter. I get that a lot. I get that a lot, particularly in Australia, can I say. Oh, yeah, the research, you know, great results. Writing doesn't matter too much. Now, I've recently seen a fantastic research project, fantastic results, knocked back by nature, knocked back by science. Not because of the calibre of the results. Referee 2, always a problem, referee 2 acknowledged, clearly, fantastic results, outstanding results. But the project has not been geared for the nature audience or the science audience. So that great research, the great results, had no sense of the audience and no sense how to temper, I'm using that verb correctly, how to temper those results for those specific audiences. Therefore, when you pretty well stop at the first draft and go golden, uh, then you're not thinking enough about those great results. You're not giving them the respect they deserve because those results deserve to find an audience. And that audience is found through drafting, revision, and editing. Also, attention to detail in those final corrections is absolutely necessary. As a supervisor, as you know, and there's been an earlier vlog on this, which a lot of you have used, my 10 drafts to submission, and I still do that to this day. So there's the first draft, and the student and I go through 10 iterative drafts and submit. So I still do that as a process. But can I say, where it gets stressful for me is I call draft 10 the examiner's draft. So everything should be done at that point, and I'm doing the final draft, draft 10, with an examiner's hat on going, would I pass this? And if I would pass it, where would I place it? So that's an important read. But can I say it's quite stressful for me as a supervisor when I'm supposedly doing the examiner's read and I find a whole series of brand new errors in this final draft, including spelling errors. So the change that's happened to me as a supervisor in the last five years, and this is horrific, which is why I'm sharing it with you, is that I'm actually today, compared to five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago, I'm doing much more work on students' drafts today than I was earlier in my career. And stuff like, for example, every single draft I receive from my students, I have to put it through a spelling checker first for every single one of those 10 drafts because the student hasn't done it, right? And we're talking about basic grammatical errors, spelling errors, and sentences that just don't make sense. So for students submitting work to us with these very basic errors, some things occur. And for the students out there watching this, think about this when you've said, look, I've sent my draft out to my supervisor and they've just returned it with typographical errors and prose errors corrected. 
they don't matter. Firstly, they're crucial. Remember what's happening here. A supervisor has found two hours or five hours or maybe even ten hours to read a piece of work, a chapter or your entire thesis, right? That's all the time they've got. And they have to spend that time on basic corrections if that is the calibre of the draft that you've presented to them. Because the problem is a series of spelling errors and grammatical errors that's not just minor typographical issues, that's much more serious because suddenly the thesis drops like a stone below the line. So it, it doesn't pass. So if we've just got those basic errors, it cascades down. So we have to address those before we even get to the research to give it a fighting chance of success. So if the prose is sloppy, then the examiners unfortunately read that sloppy prose as a proxy for the calibre of the research. So as you can see, editing matters a great deal. And Victoria has asked me a question, hi Vic, Victoria has asked me a question that I will just address here before I do the final big crunchy tips for you. And she asked me, how do I know a draft is good enough to send to a supervisor? So Vic, I'll answer that here. The little trick I would give you is a little one, and that is give your supervisor drafts little and often, little and often throughout the candidature. The best students I ever supervise, hello Alyssa, you're doing this well my darling, the best students produce what I used to call a discussion paper. So informal, formal writing once a week of a thousand words or 1500 words. What they're reading, an idea, a concept they're playing with, something they're developing. Now make it solid writing then your supervisor can engage with it and enjoy it. It's a thousand words, wow, that's really interesting. And they can make some corrections and then you can move that back to what could become a chapter and then when you come to write the chapter, there's already magically sort of 10,000 words of discussion papers. So it's fantastic. Now this is a way to scaffold your writing. But it also means that you're making it easier on yourself. You're compiling ideas so that chapters almost write themselves. And for me, what makes uh, a draft devastating? So as a supervisor, when I'm reading student drafts, little and often is great for me, but why I get cross isn't even the word, I just sort of head on hands, head banging desk stuff, is when I read multiple sentences where I just don't know what's going on. So, you know, I read a sentence, I read a sentence, I read 10,000 words, I read 50,000 words, and I'm just not sure what's happening. They're very, very hard drafts to engage with. And of course, the biggie that makes me lose the will to live is when I continue to correct errors that I've corrected in the previous draft. So I have a pretty good memory and I am a pretty good editor. So I will continue to find the same errors. So if I've spent all this time and you as a student, you've decided, oh, well, I can't be bothered. I can't, I can't be bothered opening that draft and making those corrections and then you present it for me again, I'm going to keep finding those errors through those 10 drafts until you actually correct it. But it gets a bit soul destroying. So here we are, little and often, that's the best way to get the drafting party going. We are so happy to, if you can tell us when we're approaching a draft, look, I'm happy with this but I just don't really know about that. And that helps us, right? Oh, right, so we can offer some ideas, some strategies for that. Or here's an idea, here's another idea, no idea how they link. So for, as a supervisor, we can provide that link for you. So that's great. If you give us direction into a draft, that's brilliant. Remember, we are here to help. That's the role. So now that I've established the importance of these drafting cycles, let me put in place now 10 quick tips, and they are very quick to help you wherever you are in your candidature to edit, to draft, to revise. So the pointed ways in which you go into this discussion. One, clarity of project. The point of editing your thesis is to render the point of the research clear. The nightmare thesis for supervisors and for examiners involves us reading and rereading and rereading and rereading, and we have actually no idea what's going on. And this is frequently a prose issue, not a research issue. Now, if I've just described you, so your supervisor keeps putting comments on your draft like, what is happening in this sentence? Or, I've tried to work with this paragraph. I, 
I'm not sure what you're doing. If you're getting those sort of questions, here is how you fix it. Two strategies. First one, wherever you are in your candidature, even in the first month, if people are going, not sure what's happening here, stop everything and write your abstract. Now, normally the abstract is basically the last thing you write. If you're getting the correction, what are we doing here? I'm sorry, what's the connection here? If you're getting that repetitively, then wow, it's time to write your abstract. So the abstract is great because it will force you to explain yourself. So the abstract basically is about what are you doing and why should I care? So if you can put in an abstract, this is what I'm doing, and you can finish the end of this sentence, my original contribution to knowledge is, if you can write that, even if it changes, but just write that because that'll hold your writing together. So when your supervisor says, what am I reading? You can tell them, right? That's why the abstract's useful. Secondly, if people are getting lost in your work, place attention on topic sentences. That is the first sentence in every paragraph. If people read your work and they just can't find their way through it, that's a lot of you, I know. The problem is often caused by the first sentence in every paragraph. So you know what? Spend a day and go through and with a ruler, put a ruler under it, read your first sentence and correct it. So actually, if you just read the first sentences, it is the spine of the argument. It is a tour guide. Your topic sentences are a tour guide that moves your reader through the environment. Okay? And that will ensure there is a pathway through your research. Important one. Two, the best writing is organized writing. The nightmare draft for students and supervisors, and we've all seen it, is what I call the chaotic draft. And this emerges particularly in the empirical sciences and the applied social sciences. We see it a lot. And it emerges in response to the sad, sad, nay, desperate cry, how the hell am I going to organise this data set? Okay. So, oh my goodness me, we see it in qual, we see it in quant, and we particularly see it in mixed methods. So, everyone in allied health, hello, I feel your pain. So, here you are, you've got data everywhere, and you go, yeah, no. So, here is my recommendation. If you've got data everywhere, and you've got no idea how to change data into prose, what I want you to do is, before you write a word, I just want you to sit with your data for a while. Just sit with it. Just sit. And then don't think of yourself as a PhD student or a researcher. Think of yourself as a data curator. A data curator. So your role is to care for the data. You're caring for the data. Then ask yourself, once you're caring for the data, this is the important bit, what is the story that this data set tells? What is the story? of the data set. What is the story of the data? Write that down. Think about it. Write it down. Write it down. So when you come to write those data heavy chapters, you've got to hold on to the idea of why the data sets are there. So you have two jobs, not one job, you have two jobs. What is the data set? What and why? Why does the data set matter? So students get themselves into drafting hell if they focus on the data, 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 what, 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 what. It sounds like a, a soccer cry. Data, 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 what, what, what. But they focus on the what and they lose the why, why, why. What, 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 not why, why, why. So when you're drafting data-heavy material, you always have to make sure that the data sings. And the data can sing if you focus not only what it is, but why it matters. Three, remember everybody's first draft is a complete and utter embarrassment. Dear friends, we never see anybody else's first drafts because they are humiliating. Everybody's first draft, everybody's first draft should be private <laughs> because it is shamefully mediocre. This is not you. It's not you. This is everybody. So always remember the first draft 
is a great achievement. Acknowledge it, celebrate it, feel the relief of the first draft. But I want you to feel something else. The first draft gives you the opportunity now to build it into something spectacular. You can't build the house without the foundation. And the first draft is your foundation. The first draft is a relief. I know that. Feel that relief. I'm working on a lot of projects at the moment. The first draft, you just go, wow, okay. Ooh, I'm going to get to the deadline. That's great. So the first draft is done and feel that. But then know that the next stage of your work starts now. The job of the first draft, which is sometimes very unattractively referred to as the vomit draft. Oh, dear me. But the point of the vomit draft like vomiting really, is it's for your eyes only. <laughs> and remember, you're going to see passive voice, spelling errors, grammatical errors, it's going to be a shambles. But remember, the shambles can allow you to improve and improve it one sentence at a time. Four, crucial one, this might change the life of some of our students really struggling with writing, okay? Why, why you're a slow writer, you know, people, I'm so slow. Um, people are slow if they are confusing writing and editing. Writing and editing are different activities. They are different. Now, you can't do any editing unless you have writing. So you need writing to create the editing, and that's why the first draft is so important. But also, the problem comes in when the students confuse writing and editing or writing and drafting. You know the students that write six words and then erase four of them and then go again and then go again and then go again? Yeah, please don't do that. Please don't do that. What you need to do is actually do write that first draft. Just write it. No judgment, just write it. And then action editing. They are different things, okay? And point five shows you how to do those different things. Five, work on both paper and screen drafts. There's a whole series of arguments and theories from the last 40 years of media studies, of interface studies that we can use here. So this has some pretty good form. But journalists and academics use this technique. So absolutely, do the first few drafts on screen. I always do. So get rid of the spelling, the grammar, the passive voice. You can do that on a screen, that's great. But then by about, often with me it's about draft four or five, I move to paper and paper-based drafts. And actually, I do my paper-based draft. I have a big black chair that I think we've recorded a vlog in. Uh, and I sit with my paper-based draft in that chair, often on a Saturday afternoon. But I head for paper. The reason why paper matters, there are many reasons. They are different platforms. One of the differences is a piece of paper is a different shape. And why that matters is if you're looking at the flow of ideas, like paragraphing, then screens, you notice as we've used more and more screens, paragraph length has reduced because we're thinking that's sort of the proportion of the screen, whereas actually great paragraphing offers, op operates and occupies about two thirds of a piece of paper, more than a single screen. So paragraphing, you can enact great attention through a paper-based draft. So if you're looking at paragraphing, paper edits are great, particularly also when I'm looking for gaps so here's a point, and it might be between paragraphs or in sentences. Here's a point, here's another point, and on paper, I seem to recognise, wow, there's no connection between those, those points. I've just put them together, I've fused it. So I need, so what I do is I then create an arrow right in that spot there, and then I write another sentence or another paragraph to make that transition. Yep, really important. I'm also aware, though, for the crew with text based impairments. Hi, tr hi crew, you're wonderful. That using paper can be a challenge, but obviously we've now got this great dyslexia, dyslexia, this brand new font. Actually, when I say brand new, I think it was about 2016, 17. But dyslexia, great font that particularly is geared for some crew with dyslexia. Obviously, it doesn't work for all because dyslexia are very, very wide church. But do please have a go with that font and also Famously, the old trick is blue paper, but of course there's many different modes of blue paper. So maybe pick the font and pick the paper that is useful to you. And again, tell your supervisor about this and we can enact those different prose engagements and editing cycles in and through paper, blue paper, using that font, right? It can make a real difference.
But the whole point of that, this conversation is vary between platforms. Move the drafting between different platforms, different screens, different types of paper. You see it differently. And of course, six, read it aloud. Read it aloud. Now, you might be thinking, wow, Tara, are you kidding me? It's painful enough that I'm reading this draft, okay? Reading the draft on paper silently is hard enough. Now you want me to read my embarrassment aloud. Yeah, no, I get that. But particularly for the key moments of your thesis, the abstract, the introduction, and the conclusion, reading them aloud is a great way to focus on every word and the development of the big, crunchy argument. Also, if there is a sentence where your supervisor states, and I do this where I, I just highlight it or I put it in bold, and I say, mate, I've been staring at the sentence for 15 minutes, I've had a few goes, I just can't work out what you mean. So if you're getting that type of commentary from your supervisor, you know what, with that sentence, read it aloud for me. So read it aloud, go, what do I mean? Read it aloud and keep working that sentence until it makes sense. What do you mean? So reading it aloud can help you make sense of it. So when you change the focus from visual literacy, that is print, to sonic literacy, sound, it is a great strategy to do what we call defamiliarize your relationship with the text. So it's a different type of drafting. Seven, remember your audience. When we were kids, when we were little people, we all invented private languages. Iggy biggy, tiki ka, bada bada, ah, lots of lots of nouns and consonants in my particular languages. Uh, have I just overshared? Didn't you do that? Is that just me? Oh, that's an embarrassment. But your PhD is not just written in your private language. Your PhD, and this might be a moment for some of you, your PhD is not written for you to read it. It's not written for you. It's written for examiners and it's written for stakeholders who later read your research. So when you've finished those first rough few drafts, okay, and you go, oh, I really like this. Yes, all oh, the improvement. Yes, yeah, I like it a lot. Then you've gone, well, you like it a lot. You're, you're not the audience for it. <laughs> so at about draft three or four again, move to the consideration of your audience. So think about how your audience will read and understand this work. So the focus on the audience can radically transform your research and it can be transformative for your prose as well, particularly if you want to sharpen it, which leads to sharpening point eight, cut your prose by 10% of length. Now, you know you are editing effectively if your document reduces in size. Now I know students panic, like they've written the first draft and they're editing and it becomes smaller, not larger. That's a very good sign. And your students don't panic about this, okay? So your draft suddenly does this, like what is going on? Actually what's happened is you're getting the arguments out, but you're sharpening them. And when you sharpen an argument, it reduces in size. So actually, at that point, you know your editing is working incredibly well. So don't think that the reduction is a problem. The reduction in length through editing shows you're getting it right. And a reduction in drafts of about 10%, particularly for the first few, is seen to be valuable. In fact, Stephen King, the legend that is Stephen King, quantifies it as he does many things about writing. He believes your second draft is not finished until it has reduced by 10%. So you have to keep going until it has reduced by 10% and then, yes, your second draft is done. Nine, transitions matter. I'm asked a lot about what makes great writing. Tremendous question, I think. And for me, a great writer is able to construct great transitions. So you have a great topic sentence, it's all flowing beautifully, and most importantly, the hardest sentence to always write is the final sentence in each paragraph. And you can do that beautifully. So great writers 
give us excitement. Excitement because we're waiting for the next moment. We're waiting, particularly in academic writing, it's tremendous if someone can do this. So you've got a paragraph and the reader is going, this is brilliant, and you carry it into the story of the data. It's amazing. So these transitions, this momentum in your prose, this is the toughest stuff to do. And it doesn't emerge through the writing. The momentum emerges through the editing and the drafting and revising. So it's, it, it's about, like in my big black chair behind us, it's about saying, here's an idea, here's an idea. How do they link? How do they link? And when you sit in that for a moment and you force yourself to write that transition, so what? there it is, there it is, how do they link? And you work it out. That's your best work. That's your best work. Ten. Great introductions and conclusions are created through drafting, editing and revising, not writing. So the hardest paragraphs, the hardest sections that you ever write are the introduction and the conclusion of an article, a chapter, a thesis. Why? It's because the start and the end, they have to take the heavy lifting for the prose. So they have to take the weight of your argument. An introduction has a lot of functions. It has to hook in your reader, calm the reader, confirm your credibility, so what I call calm the farm. So the introduction basically has to say to the reader, I know what I'm doing, you can just relax in this, you don't have to go, ooh, you don't have to get all tense and worried, I know what I'm doing, follow me on the journey. And at its best, the introduction is a tour guide explaining what the journey will be. The conclusion, wow, is even tougher. A conclusion has to be meaningful, considered, credible, drag queen bold, has to be bold and fabulous, and also tough. The best conclusions are tough, they have grit, they're robust. So these paragraphs in our first, second, third drafts are often almost written with holder paragraphs. So here's sort of something that's holding the place because you don't really know what the introduction and the conclusion is until you've sanded it down and you've worked out what the argument is, yeah? So what happens is the intro and the conclusion have to create the balance in your chapter. So you've got to know what the chapter's about before it can be balanced out. And also remember my old line that I use every single day, put the problem into the work. So. Say you're reading your chapter or you're reading your introduction and your conclusion, you get to the conclusion and you realise, wow, the issues are unresolved. So this matter is hanging. It's hanging. What do you do? So put the problem into the work. In your conclusion, grab that thing that's hanging and say in your conclusion, this matter is unresolved. Now, first thing, by, by noting that it's unresolved, in many ways you're resolving it, you're plaiting it back into the story. But the best writing, and I get quite emotional when, when I see it, I'm getting emotional now talking about it. The best writing, particularly in books, also in theses, is when someone does that, they wrestle with this thing and they go, this matter is unresolved. And you know what? We're going to resolve it in the next chapter. So, of course, what you've just done is created momentum. People go, oh, yeah, come on. And so you see what I mean, but robust. Oh, so you've gone, I've got this, I've got this, and you know what, I've got this now. We're going we're gonna to work through this problem together. Are you with me? People go, yeah, let's do this, okay? So as you can see, this unresolved matter, if it can then become the foundation for something else, maybe it's a theoretical exploration of where these ideas can go. People go, yeah, wow, that's fantastic. So as you can see, drafting, editing, revision, this stuff is not sexy. It's really not sexy. It's also not really exciting. This is the meat and potatoes of what we do in research. But without the meat and potatoes, or the vegan equivalent, there actually is no meal. There's no nutrition, and we as an audience, we go hungry. So the first draft is all very intellectual canapas. That's nice, that's nice, that's great, but it ain't no meal. So the starter of the meal is great, but remember that we need the meat, we need the potatoes, or the vegan equivalent. Give me the meal. 
and make it brilliant. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.